tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. With us in the studio is painter Kristen Calabresi and author Diane Leslie. Kristen Calabresi was born in California but traveled the country in her youth, living in many different places. She eventually lived in Arizona, where she graduated from high school, and then earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Art Institute in San Francisco as a painting major. Was your fine arts degree something that you always looked forward to? Well, I always wanted to be an artist, but um, I didn't really know about art school until I was in my 20s. Oh, but you did want to paint? Or you did I want to I always wanted to be a painter since I was three. What were you doing uh, that, that led you to, to know that? I don't know. <laughs> I just did. Were you painting all the time? Um, I was drawing and painting a little bit in acrylics, and um, I didn't really start painting in oils until I got to the Art Institute. When you got to the Art Institute, which is great, it has that Diego Rivera. It's a great school. <laughs> doesn't it? It has that Diego Rivera mural yeah. that I absolutely love. But when you got there, um, the trend was really abstract. And your uh -huh. painting is so far from abstract. Did that inhibit you in any way? Well, it was good that it was a, a very abstract school because they, they encouraged us to focus on content first. And um, <clears throat> so even though I couldn't paint very realistically, I could make paintings. They just encourage you to make really big paintings and <laughs> do a lot of work. And I, um, I really wanted to paint realistically, so they sent me on a studio program in New York for a semester. Oh, they and did? And there I really started um, painting from photos, which was really discouraged. So, and then I came back and a lot of teachers didn't like them so much because they were from photos, but a lot of teachers did. So, but what, was the idea of painting representational art okay at that time? I mean, did your peers think it was okay? Uh, I think you know some of the like more like bad girl types. I mean, not really bad <laughs> girl, but bad girl. You know, uh -huh. um, were into it. You know, but then a lot of people uh, sort of wondered you know, why I'd sort of abandoned the more abstract ways of painting. How do you describe your work? Um, well, I think of it as, as realism, um, but not, not so much photorealism, but I want them to be um, sort of like what it feels like to be alive, what it feels like to drive down the street, what it feels like to mm. live in my house, what it feels like to, I, they're a lot about memory, they're a lot about um, uh, the way like um, the painting here is, um, is really about memory because when you think back of, of yourself and you picture yourself in a house, you don't usually picture the house around you, you picture like the back of yourself in the setting. Mm. So they have a lot to do with um, you know, memory and what things feel like. and. That, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, when, when I saw the, when I first saw the paintings, they were in the Gagosian Gallery in Beverly Hills. And they are absolutely huge. I mean, they're enormous in size. And the idea of physically moving and painting something like that struck me. How do you do that? I mean, we're talking uh -huh. 8 by 10 feet, uh, right? Yeah, and 8 by 12. And, 8 by 12. And, yeah, well, like when I, it's like it's really hard on your hand when you're um, when you're painting. So I can't really paint with my hand over my head because my hand falls asleep. So what I do is I set up tables uh -huh. and I stand on tables and then I put chairs on top of tables and I stand on chairs. But do you hang it on a wall? No, I lean them. Oh, you lean them and paint uh -huh. that way because uh, the, I mean you have to have a big studio too. I have a huge studio. Oh, I see. I have a 2,700 square feet in Inglewood with 16 foot ceilings. So what do you do? You you take a table the size of something here 
Mm, taller or, table, like tall? a tall like school table, like a cafeteria table. Uh -huh. And then I try to find like a strong metal chair and I put that on there and then I climb so up on the like table on a and ladder? on the, yeah. Do you have a lot of chairs so you're moving across I have a lot this? of chairs <laughs> and I have like painting things that, that move around on wheels and I use TV trays for pallets. And Did you figure this out yourself? Yeah, it just gradually you're like, how am I going to do this? And then you're like, oh, put this chair put the table here, the chair. Yeah, it just it sort of develops after a while. That's what I was wondering because I thought, first of all, are you thinking about the common person who would buy one of these paintings? Because who has 12 feet or 10 feet? I'm not thinking about the person who would buy them at all. I'm just thinking about making them. I see. Because the ordinary person couldn't buy something that big. I mean, this piece on the set is more manageable. And I know that's a terrible thing to say right. to an artist because you paint what you feel like painting. And right. And, you know, I never thought I'd sell anything or that anyone would ever <laughs> want anything. I just um, made it because I wanted to make it. And then I, I like to start out with a group of paintings in a room that's empty. And then I just sort of fill it up. And, and it's kind of like you're filling up the room with yourself. You can so, be in the room with yourself. Uh -huh. And then you can... Um, then you can see who you are, or something like that. So when you paint a couch, that uh -huh. couch isn't in the room with you. Um, actually, so to speak. one of those paintings that's in the gallery, uh, I have that couch, and it's in my studio. Mm. But the rest of the room is not there. So you so conjure I'm, up these ideas. So I made the other stuff up from oh, like, yeah, from childhood memories, and I put them together with that couch that I had and a doll there's a doll on the floor in that one and I actually had the doll so I put it on the floor on the other side of the room try to figure out where it would be in the painting I see so you actually set it up in a way in the painting uh, you paint in oils too mm -hmm. which is kind of rare even though people think that painters always paint with oils it's very traditional uh-huh and I think people paint Painters paint with acrylics a lot today, don't they? I think it's ki kind of half and half. It Is just it? depends on how long you want the paint to stay wet. <laughs> it's like and oils keep it wet, right? Yeah, but it's really you. You can really only work with the paint for a few days with it, it with it really wet. But um, like acrylics, they dry in three hours. So you know, it's you have to really go fast. And with oils, you can sort of have a palette of color out and the same palette will stay wet for like you know a week and you won't have to keep remixing the color and trying um, to get it the same. Oh is that the, that's a the reason. problem or that's, that's a reason? That's a problem yeah and um, I don't know oil paint is kind of like richer the colors are more rich. But one of the, the things end. that I noticed that you paint you paint in gray tones. Uh -huh. Gris grisai, grise? Yeah, well, what do you say? Grise, um, we have some of those. We'll, we'll show them um, gray and white, or they look like gray and white paintings to right. me. Right. Well, there's a picture of a car. It looks like gray tones to me. Well, it, it is gray tones, but um, I think grise is actually when you paint with actual black and white paint. And you mix them? And these aren't painted with black and white paint, I even see. though they look gray. They're painted with red and green and blue and So you're orange. mixing your palette. Right. But the grise. Compl I, complimentary colors. Grise is just black and white. Yeah. And whatever you get out of it, different intensities. It's gray, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I painted those because um, I wanted the, I painted them in gray because I wanted the, uh, that was a, they're paintings of an apartment that I was living in at the time. That was where I, I was living. And I didn't, I wasn't very happy there. And I didn't really like the apartment. Oh, I see. No, uh, the reason I painted him gray was because I try to, you know, force myself to be happy where I am when I'm there because I usually end up missing whatever I didn't like at the time. <laughs> So I painted them in gray even though I was there because I figured I would miss them later. Oh, that's... So <laughs> these are, in a way, now that I'm talking to you, kind of documentations of you, your life. Right. And, and you do a lot of L.A. scenes. Right. I, I have these, um, these pictures of uh, paintings of um, many uh, little buildings from L.A. and cars and also um, words and little messages to people. And they're because I've, you know, been driving in L.A. <laughs> and 
Well, and then I just love it here. I think it's beautiful. I love the palm trees and I love the architecture. And I really love, you know, even like kind of, you know, the, the big apartment complex that has like somebody's towel hanging over it. <laughs> when you can see like what people are really like and they start letting their personalities outside their front door, I think it's really interesting. Is this uh, painting here um, on the set part of... Uh this painting. Your life. <laughs> yeah, that was my windowsill, actually. And, uh, hold, hold it up. Uh, okay. Where did I oh, that's here? great, yeah. Yeah, um, these, this is actually, this is my boyfriend's sister's dollhouse furniture. Hold it a little higher. Boyfriend's there, sister yeah. dollhouse house furniture there. And I was staying at his parents' house in North Carolina. And, um, oh, so it's a little teeny. Teeny yeah. stuff. This is everything. They're all life size, pretty much. Like if it's the if there's a refrigerator in it. Let me take it. It's the size of a refrigerator. I mean, you can describe it. Yeah. Or if there's right. a bed in it, then it's the size of a bed. But this painting, though, that's like Laura Ashley print that comes off uh -huh. of my bedspread, uh -huh. which is actually on the bedspread too. Uh -huh. But I felt like while I was staying at her house, I was just so like immersed in Laura Ashley. So um, I took her dollhouse furniture, painted it like Laura Ashley. And then when I moved to LA, I put those on my windowsill, so. We have another one um, that's a bed uh, um, right there. Is that the red bed? No, that's the gray no, bed. that's the gray bed. Then we have another one that's, uh, that, that's all done in gray tones. Then we have another one that's a red bed. Right. And that goes with these ones. It, go, it, was, it was in the same house. Oh, it was. So when, when that comes on the screen, we'll talk about, there it is. Yeah. Well, we had a, um, I mean, the streamer there is from a party that we had not too long before that. There's also like um, sock, there's a sock on the floor. There's a little, um, there's a little uh, Valentine pillow on the floor. So it's just, uh, it's really like writing a book. Yeah, it's right, like writing a book. I think it's like important to make it um, personal and, you know, of the moment. I like to, you know, sort of mark time in them. One of the things um, you, uh, whether you've been lucky or not lucky, Four of your paintings were bought by the Saatchi Collection in London, which is a very famous collection. Do you think that helps make or break someone's career? Um, that's what people are telling me. You think I it? mean, they're saying that it'll help a lot, but um, but I don't know. <laughs> and, and just before we go, I want to ask you one thing. It's so representational, and, and say somebody like Richard Diebenkorn, who started out Whose painting, work I love. Whose work you love. But he got, the lines got less and less, and the uh, subject matter got more mm -hmm. diffused, and it became very abstract. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself ever painting like that? No, I mean, I might, I, 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 I do sometimes, like, take, um, I do sometimes take like a pattern out of something and maybe uh -huh. I'll make a big painting that's just stripes oh, so or make a big painting that's just um, lines but those those are um, the stripe painting with it's kind of like drips I thought of those as the painting of candle wax dripping so uh -huh. they always have some sort of um, relation to the other paintings um, Richard Diebenkorn's paintings are a lot having to do with light and right. and uh, light and color and, and filling mine, that space yeah and mine do too already so but i think i might lean more towards like words uh -huh. like a, a whole painting covered with words really and the words would maybe be like super typography style you know ah. all sorts of crunchy funky words and stuff but but i like to sort of um i like to sort of jump around a little bit i like to do one body of work at a time and you know, maybe do some that are really different next time and then so you know, that's back what, and forth. Now, and now we're going to be looking for your work. Now that we know Kristen Calabresi, you can't believe the time is already finished. So oh, it is. Oh, it good. Is. So, we want to thank you for bringing your work on and explaining it to us. And we hope to see your work all over the world. Thank you. Don't go a bit away because we're going to be right back with author um, Diane Leslie, who's going to tell us about her life. I can't believe oh, that, that was fun.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with author Diane Leslie, who was born in Hollywood and raised in Beverly Hills. By 19, she was a TV researcher. Does that mean you weren't doing anything else, or were you in college at the time? No, I was, I was out of college. Um, I just didn't spend much time in college, <laughs> and, uh, and I got this terrific job through nepotism, of course, because that's how anybody young gets a Hollywood job. Did you do all your schooling in Los Angeles? Well, uh, most of it. Um, I was uh, sent away to private school. Oh, you were at, where? Uh, well, to Arizona, oh. and that's the next book, so I'm, I'm not prepared to, to <laughs> <That's>, discuss it. <laughs> that tells us where you're going. <laughs> Did you always dream about writing? Well, my mother was a screenwriter, and so I grew up with lots of, especially lady writers in the house. Mm. And um, I just, it was kind of assumed that I would write. My father, when I ever went to him with a complaint or anything that was, he considered bad news, he would say, oh yeah, well go write it down. Oh, really? So that's maybe how I got my start as a writer. Did you write those things down? I did. And I find them, I, can't, I kept diaries and from the time I was quite small, and I can't read them. I, it's, Give us a little more thumbprint, because I think it's interesting. You're, you said your mother had writers over all the time, and you lived in a house that um, was filled with Hollywood people which you alluded to as nepotism or getting right. jobs through right. ways like that? Well, it was quite fascinating. My, my true childhood, I, I've dressed this up somewhat in my book and uh -huh. uh, picked out the most glamorous or unglamorous characters. But uh, th there were a lot of emigres in Hollywood in my childhood who people with fascinating backgrounds uh, who had left Europe because of the war. They had atrocious, but to me, very marvelous accents. They were struggling with English, but they were writing in this, or acting in the studios. So uh, were all, are all these people, I didn't mention your Simon & Schuster book, Fleur de Lis' Life of Crime, a novel by Diane Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure that this background that we're building shows um, what you put in your book. Well, yes, uh, this is an autobiographical novel. And um, some of the people who I knew as a child just wangled the way, their way into my book under a different name. <laughs> they did. Oh, uh, they definitely did. How did these people start feeling when they uh, were reading about themselves? I know they've had a long, they had a long time to read about it because it's 20 weeks on the LA Times <laughs> list. So they've yeah. had a chance to say, I know Diane Leslie, let's see what her book is about. Well, the one who gets, the worst treatment was this wonderful actress, a character actress who worked for my mother. My mother did have a radio show, though earlier than the one in the book. And uh, she, she was, oh, you saw her on everything, um, selling all kinds of things and commercials in later years. But she had this very squeaky kind of voice. I know my father just shook when she was around. Not that voice. <laughs> um, and so I made quite a lot of use of her in, in my book. And the funny thing is what she was noted for in our household was that she was a stealer of stories. Ah. My mother would tell a story like most writers do, um, you know, about herself, and then that story would come back to her only, and now I'm going to call her by the name in the book, uh, only somebody would say, oh, Susie just told the mar most marvelous thing that happened about her. And, and she took the credit for it. Right. <laughs> well, so so drove my mother is she alive? That well, woman? you know, she, she was alive uh, and came to my book signing and read my book and told me, you're a lot better writer than your mother. Oh, um, did she? <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, and that's my pool in the book. Oh, so she started but, noticing things, but, right? But she never said it. she knew it was her. Um, <laughs> the, 
you worked at, at a bookstore for years and years and years. and I'm worked, still there. Are you still there? Yeah. And worked with a lot of writers. How did you develop your own style? How did you uh, not say, take somebody else's or start writing and say, oh, that's somebody else's style or uh, hmm. I just read that. What I wrote just now is what I just read. How did you individualize yourself? That's a fabulous question. <laughs> um, it, because I think that's the hardest part of writing, especially if it's autobiographical. Um, I, I knew a lot of children of movie stars, and I also read their books. And I was determined mm. not to write a book like that, a complaining book about how awful it is to be one of those kids. And there were a lot of those books, weren't there? Yeah. And they yeah. were interesting because they were from a youthful point of view. I th they were. They were interesting to me. But they, they're they also very whiny. <laughs> and I felt that by the end of these biography or autobiographies, you weren't sympathetic to them anymore. I mean, you know, how can you have your own horse and go to school in a limousine, <laughs> you know, and, and fly in a, your own plane right. and have a glamorous life and then be saying, oh, it was so awful. Uh, and then whine about it. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm interested in humor. And I just, I felt, I really worked at having this be funny as well as difficult. Wait, back to working in a bookstore, did that help you get published? Um, it helped a lot me of people, learn to write. A lot of, well, that's what we're talking about. It did help you learn to write. But did you have connections that say, uh, if I were writing and writing and writing, I don't have those connections? Did you know publishers personally? I, I didn't know any publishers or editors because they're not out in LA. Uh. But I must say that the, the person who helped me get the agent that I got was someone I knew from our store. Oh, so, so it, it indirectly mm -hmm. helped you in, mm -hmm. a, in a way. When you were writing it, were you writing it with a movie in mind? No. No. <laughs> Is there a movie in mind? <laughs> well, not, I'm not thinking about movies. I, I just, um, my mother just last night was saying, well, what about a movie, Dad? Right. You know? <laughs> and, but I'm just, I'm waiting. I, I'm, I don't know. I'm going to write more about these characters, and I don't want to think of it with a particular actress. I want to see my mm. own characters. When you developed uh, Fleur de Lis, which is Fleur de Lis, Miss <laughs> Leslie with her fleur in her hair, uh, <laughs> Life of Crime was the first section that you had written, and it was read at the Getty yes, Museum, which was. was pretty great. It was a wonderful evening um, with champagne. Who read it? <laughs> it was Jill Eikenberry. Uh -huh. And it, w it really meant a lot to me because it gave me a great deal more confidence about the rest of it. And that part that was read won the Catherine Ann Porter Prize. Mm -hmm. So th that was also a wonderful coup. Was that written first and then the rest of this followed? Well, actually, the first uh, the first part of this I wrote was about our gardener oh. uh, while I was growing up, who was this really fascinating. He never wore a shirt, rain or shine, and I <laughs> guess he was what you call a bodybuilder. And I wrote a, a short story about him that I f it never gelled. It mm. just never was the perfect short story. And then after that, I remember I'd had 60 nannies during my childhood. So That's also <laughs> reflected in the book, right? So many nannies. Yeah. Could you ever remember their names? Oh, I can. I know all their names. <laughs> I gave them different names in the book. Um, but I started writing about my favorite nanny, and then that became that story. I see. And then I realized, no, I, after I got that story published. No, I'm really writing a novel. And, and then went from there. How physically did you write the book? Just actually sit down and write? Did you type, computer, Well, notes? I have a computer. I use that. Uh, I found for a while, and maybe it's just uh, techniques. I don't seem to do it anymore. But I read it aloud a great deal. 
as um, you wrote? Yes, I, because I'm writing, I wanted humorous mm. lines, and there's something about the, the tempo of it that was very important to me. I don't know if I've now internalized that, but I find I don't need to read aloud now. But that's funny that you were talking about reading aloud, and the first part of your book was read yeah. aloud at the Getty, like a play in a way. Yeah, I, I, <coughs> I'm, I love listening to people. And then the question is, I, I remember all kinds of conversations that I've heard in my life. But when you, when you hear a conversation, do you run home and jot no, it down? No, I don't, but they come back to me. In fact, I often remember a really interesting conversation that I had with someone, and I can't remember who it was, but I remember every word, and, and I remember how they worded it. But if you put that with a character, then does the real conversation come back to you eventually? No, once the character starts talking, then, then it, I, it doesn't, then the character takes over. Is that right? Yeah, but the, the Susie and the real person, I, can, I certainly can distinguish, but they're very close. How did your mother react um, because of the way you talk about her? Well, my mother, the mother in the book, <laughs> is kind of the villain in the book. And I gave the book to my mother before it was set into print and said, if you object to anything, then oh. let me know and I'll take it out if there's something. And I thought, I may never hear from her again. But she called me the next day and she just loves the book. And oh, she great. sent it to her relatives. Oh, that's great. <laughs> now, one question before we leave, because our time is up. Would you ever rewrite this as a real autobiography, naming real names <laughs> and real places? No, I wouldn't, because I, I found that I could be more honest using fictional technique than I could, but I would oh. never hurt certain people. That's interesting. I felt I could really tell the truth of a childhood like mine. Some of, some of the writers say that an unhappy childhood is a really great source of material. <laughs> yeah, if only you knew that when you were a child, That's you know, right. it would be okay. That's <laughs> really great. <laughs> Diane Leslie, thank you so much for being with us today, and good luck on your next book. Thank you. We'll see you again. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today on the Joan Quinn Profiles. And keep writing to us at 777 South Figueroa, Los Angeles, 900-17, 44th floor. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.